Dr. Pardo is going to provide us with a really excellent foundation for understanding the other presentations you're going to hear today. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Sandy, for uh, inviting me to this uh, presentation. So I see a lot of uh, familiar faces, but I see that there are a lot of physicians here and a couple of neurologists as well. So you can leave, go and drink some coffee and enjoy uh, the 20 minutes because I'm going to talk to uh, the family and patients about uh, neurology in very late terms, okay? Uh, my challenge this morning is to explain about the brain, spinal cord, and how the brain and the spinal cord uh, function, and how brain and spinal cord are affected by different disorders, uh, some of the disorders that Dr. Irani mentioned um, uh, a few minutes ago. So let me uh, start saying that the brain is probably the most important uh, uh, organ of the body. And as a neurologist, I always say we need to protect our brains. The brain is the most important part of our bodies. And the brain is uh, the computer, the central master of our body. The brain controls everything that happens in our body. The brain is aware about everything that is happening in our body. The brain is connected with different structures of our uh, human body. Uh, there is a, a brain that is in, uh, in the head. There is a spinal cord that is inside of the spinal column. And the brain and the spinal cord are basically uh, connected through uh, 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 nerves that uh, basically provide information from the environment. Uh, our eyes are connected with the brain because we have something that we call optic nerves. Our uh, 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 ears and our uh, uh, auditory function is connected with the nerve, uh, uh, with the brain and through the nerves. And everything that we do in terms of motor activity is because the brain and spinal cord are connected with our muscles. So what is inside of the brain? So that is a, the million dollar question. And it's a fascinating uh, a structure that is comprised by uh, many cells, billions of cells, but the most important part of the uh, uh, cell population inside of the brain and the spinal cord are cells that we call neurons. So the neurons in the brain and the spinal cord are the chips of our computer, and they are designed to play different roles. So we have neurons in the brain that play a role in motor function, there are neurons inside of the spinal cord that play a role in sensory function. So there are different families and different subtypes of uh, neurons, but the important issue here is that all of those neurons are connected to each other and are basically influencing the work of this brain by allowing the brain to be aware of what is going on outside in the environment and also by generating a uh, 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 commands that are going to be sent to different organs, to different muscles on different parts of the body. Now I mentioned that uh, neurons are the most important part of the uh, brain and what we need to understand is that there are billions and billions of neurons that are distributed in the entire brain and they are very well organized and again these organization is similar to what we have in our cellular phone, what we have in our computer. There is a lot of network uh, connectivity in those neurons that facilitate the function of uh, that brain. Now, let's go a little bit in detail about what is the meaning of gray matter, what is the meaning of white matter. So all this morning and this afternoon you are going to be listening uh, lectures uh, that talk about white matter diseases, gray matter diseases, myelin. So what I like that you understand now is what is the meaning of those uh, uh, concepts. Let me introduce first the term cerebral cortex. And the cerebral cortex for us is what we call uh, 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 gray matter. So the gray matter in the brain is outside, is this cortical ribbon that is outside of the brain structure. 
And the white matter is inside of the brain structure. So everything that is blue here is part of the white matter. Everything that is pink here is part of the gray matter. So the majority of neurons that we are talking about, all of those neurons are localized in what we call gray matter structures. And again, the gray matter structures are going to be part of the cerebral cortex, are going to be part of a deep nuclei inside of the brain, and the white matter is going to be comprised by many of the uh, wires that uh, the neurons are sending down or are receiving from a spinal cord. In other words, the computer, the cell body of the computer is here in the cerebral cortex, and the wiring is here in the white matter. So that is uh, basically the concept on differentiation between cerebral cortex and white matter. Now, I mentioned before that the neuron is the most important part of that uh, 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 structure, and the neuron is a fascinated uh, cell. The neuron has a cell body and has several uh, structures that we call dendrites, and these dendrites are like hair around the cell body of the neuron. And those structures are going to be connected or maintaining the connectivity of each neuron with neurons that are in the environment. And at the same time, the neuron maintains uh, other type of connectivity using a very long structure, very long wire that we call axon. So I'd really like that you understand what is the meaning of the cell body and what is the meaning of axon, because that will apply very well to what uh, we will uh, discuss in terms of uh, neurological disease. So the brain is, I mentioned before, is a very well-organized structure, has evolved in millions of years from a small brain in the rat to a medium-sized brain in primates to a really large structure in the human being. And the human body uh, contains this brain that uh, weighs approximately uh, uh, three pounds or uh, 1,200 grams. And this is basically uh, the most uh, uh, organized structure among uh, animals. Now let's talk about the neuron again. So I mentioned before that the neuron, the main portion of the neuron is called uh, the cell body or neuron body. So that is the part of the uh, cell where all proteins are produced, where the chemicals of the cell are produced, and that is the part of uh, the cell that is basically generating all type of neurochemical activity and electrical activity that will facilitate the connectivity with other part of uh, 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 the brain or communication with other uh, uh, areas of uh, 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 different neurons in other areas of the brain. Now, a very important part of the neuron is what we call axon. And axon is basically a long wire. So just imagine a telephone. The body of the telephone needs a long wire. So that long wire in the neuron is called axon. And that axon is comprised by a portion that contains a lot of the proteins and chemicals that are being transported from the cell body to the end of uh, the axon. And one important concept for all the next three days that we are going to talk about uh, science and, and neurological problems, this wire is covered by one chemical structure that is called myelin. So this myelin is a very important for function of the axon. It's very important for the transmission of electrical impulses. So this myelin is produced by one cell that is called oligodendrocyte. So in disorders like multiple sclerosis and in disorders like transverse myelitis or immunological problems that affect the brain or the spinal cord, these are the structures that are frequently affected because the immunological reaction is producing an attack either against the myelin or against the axon. And that is what is affected, this is structure that is frequently affected in diseases like peripheral neuropathies, in diseases like diabetic neuropathy. That is the part of the neuron that is affected. 
And it's affected because this is a very susceptible area of the neuron. Let me tell you an example about this. So my hand is moving because there is one neuron in my brain that is sending one long uh, wire to the muscles of uh, my hand. So that process implies that there is a lot of chemical transportation between the cell body at the end of the axon. So any process that disrupts the function of the axon and the wire here is going to produce abnormalities and dysfunction of, uh, uh, of motor activity or sensory activity. Now, the neurons work with chemicals, and those chemicals are called neurotransmitters. And those chemicals are going to produce some type of electrical stimulation that at the end will be transformed in movement. This is an example of what happened with the muscle. So if we have a neuron, this neuron is sending these chemicals, and at the end, these chemicals are producing a stimulation of muscle fibers that eventually are going to produce the movement of a different type of muscles. So that is the principle of neuronal function, the neurochemical interaction between neurons and end target organs, like the muscle. Now, I mentioned before that neurons are very susceptible to different type of attacks. In the case of multiple sclerosis or transfer myelitis, Immune, immune reactions like uh, produced by uh, white cells can produce damage either of myelin or the axon or even the cell body that may uh, 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 translate in the destruction of that structure and obviously in dysfunction of, uh, of the neuron. Now, let's summarize here what we have learned in the last 10 minutes. Now, number one, that the central nervous system main cell is the neuron, okay? That the neuron is comprised by a cell body, axon, dendrites, and an end terminal that is going to transmit the, con the electrical impulses to uh, the target organ, many times a muscle or different organs. Number two, that neurons are organized in layers that are frequently organized in the cerebral cortex as part of the gray matter. But the other a concept that is very important to understand is that the neurons are not working alone. Neurons are working with other cells that are called glial cells. Glial cells are cells like astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, that are going to maintain the normal function of this structure. So this is uh, uh, very important for uh, the next uh, uh, few lectures because you are going to be uh, listening different concepts about axons, myelin, oligodendrocytes, blood vessels, and it's very important that you have an idea what uh, we mean with, with that. I forgot to mention that everything in the brain works because there is a blood supply, and that blood supply is facilitated by uh, uh, arteries and capillaries and blood vessels that come to the brain and facilitate a constant uh, 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 blood supply that is going to maintain the metabolic activity of the brain, spinal cord, and nerves. Now, let me talk about spinal cord, because spinal cord is one of the uh, organs that we uh, are very interested in, uh, in uh, clinical uh, aspects as well as research. So the spinal cord is part of the central nervous system. The spinal cord uh, is an extension of the central nervous system, and it's localized inside of the spinal column. And this spinal cord basically is going to produce uh, uh, a, a lot of function because it's the interaction between all uh, orders and commands that are being generated in the brain and are going down to the arms or legs. <coughs> Excuse me. And the other function that is very important is the spinal cord is collecting the information from the other parts of the body, like arms, legs, receptors on the skin, et cetera, and that spinal cord is going to send this information to the main computer that is the brain. <coughs> now, if I, do a, if I section this spinal cord here, and I do a, uh, a, a cross-section of this spinal cord, what I'm going to find is that the spinal cord is organized in compartments, and one of the compartments that is inside of the spinal cord is the gray matter. 
And this is different to the brain, where the gray matter is outside of the brain. In the spinal cord, the gray matter is inside of the spinal cord, and the white matter is outside. And this organization is just to facilitate the function of the spinal cord, because the spinal cord is uh, 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 comprised by uh, different tracks that are going up to the brain or are coming down to different parts of the body. And that is what we call ascending tracks or descending tracks. In other words, those are the fibers from neurons that are either localized in the brain that are going down and facilitating the function of um, uh, muscles or another structure of the body, or ascending tracks that are basically the wires from neurons that are in the periphery, like receptors, and are sending information up to the brain cerebral cortex, so the brain is aware about what is going on outside in the environment. Now, that function is basically uh, 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 summarized in two major functions, a function that is mostly motor function and another one that is called uh, sensory function. And let me explain motor function. And this is, uh, I need uh, some help, and probably I will call Kara, uh, uh, who is uh, uh, one of my patients that came here two years ago when Kara came here uh, two years ago to this symposium. She was in a wheelchair, but fortunately she's walking now. But I will ask Kara to help me in a demonstration of how the brain and the spinal cord are uh, working. So Kara is walking now. She's coming here. And what Kara is doing is the brain of Kara is generating a lot of motor function here that is transmitted to the spinal cord. And that group of neurons are basically localized in one area of the brain that we call motor cortex, okay? So if I ask Kara, raise your left hand, okay? So what is happening is, Kara is generating an order in the right brain. So the right brain is generating a series of commands that are localized in the motor cortex, and the order from the motor cortex is going down and is coming down to one area of the spinal cord that we call cervical spinal cord. And from there, the nerves are going to the left hand, right? So there is one concept that you need to understand here. The right brain generates the motor command that comes down, and at one level, just here in this region of of the brain that we call brainstem, the order cross to the other side. That's the reason people with right-sided stroke have left-sided motor problems, right? So all, every time that the cerebral cortex in the brain of, uh, of Cara is generating an order for moving the left uh, arm, that order is being generated in the right brain, okay? Everybody understand that, right? So the motor cortex is connected with different areas of the brain. So Kara's brain knows where different parts of the body are located, and that is going to maintain the function. So once again, the brain, the neurons in the cerebral cortex are sending very long, long peripheral nerves to this arm. And so you can imagine what is the pattern of susceptibility for damage in the brain? So the motor function can be ab abnormal because there is a damage of the cerebral cortex. The motor uh, uh, function can be abnormal because there is a damage in the brainstem. Or the motor function may be affected at the level of the spinal cord. Okay? So that is the reason when you come to the neurologist, we ask you, okay, move your right hand, your left hand, touch your nose with the right and left. And we are testing how the connectivity of the brain with different structures of your body are uh, in terms of function. Now, let me talk about another thing in terms of uh, motor function. Weakness. Meaning of weakness is at some point in any of these areas of the cerebral cortex, brainstem, or spinal cord, there is a damage that decreases the ability for this left arm to be raised, okay? So when we do a neurological exam or when we do an MRI, what we are 
checking is at what level of the brain, at what level of the spinal cord the dysfunction is located. In neurology, the most important issue is like real estate market, location, 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 <laughs> right? So the, the, the most important part of our neurological exam is try to demonstrate where the damage is. The damage may be located in the cervical cord or the damage may be located in the thoracic cord or in the lumbar cord or the damage may be here in the peripheral nerve, okay? Now, let's go and talk about uh, issues related with uh, uh, other symptoms associated with motor function. A stiffness or cramps, very frequent in patients with uh, 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 transfer myelitis. This is because the connectivity of the brain and muscles is affected. So there is a lack of balance between excited excitation of the muscle and inhibition of muscle activity. That's the reason some patients with transfer myelitis frequently are concerned about jerking of the muscle. They are weak in one leg, but occasionally that leg start moving spontaneously without any control. Why? Because this function is maintained by motor inhibition and motor excitation. And when you have a damage of the spinal cord or damage in the brain, there is a lack of equilibrium between excitation and inhibition, and that's the reason there is a lot of a spontaneous movement. Now, let's go to another function. So I'm going to ask Cara to give me her uh, right hand, okay? And many times when Cara comes to my clinic, I take a pin or a safety pin, and I start <laughs> picking there, right? So what I'm doing is I am testing if there is any disruption in the communication between sensory receptors that are in the skin, the peripheral nerve, communication with the spinal cord, and communication with the brain, okay? So in other words, what I'm doing is examining the connectivity of the sensory pathway. So in this case, the sensory pathway need to go in a long trip. See this? This is the finger, for example, the communication of this wire comes to the spinal cord, goes up to one part of the brainstem, and finally arrive to the brain, and from the brain goes to different areas of the cerebral cortex, different areas of the brain that we call somatosensory cortex. So once again, this is very well organized. And once again, when I touch uh, Cara here in, in her uh, hand, this communication is going to the other side of the brain. Okay, so that is what we understand in terms of connection of motor systems with uh, 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 sensory system. Now, sensation is something that works similarly for other type of, of functions, your eyes. So your eyes are basically receiving information, visual information, and that information is going to both sides of the brain, and in this case are coming to uh, one side of the brain that is called occipital cortex, and visual cortex. So this information is very well organized. And when we have damage of the retina or damage of the optic nerve, we are going to have basically visual loss in one side. But frequently, we have patients that have damage inside of the brain, like damage in the visual cortex. So those patients have visual problems affecting both sides, right? Both eyes or, do, or, or both uh, visual fields. So. That is uh, one of the aspects of uh, 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 sensory organization. Now, the same happened with uh, hearing. So our uh, inner ear received the stimulation, and that stimulation is going from the ear to one part of the brain that is called temporal cortex, and from the temporal cortex, is that information is distributed to different areas of the brain. Uh, thank you, Cara. So let me f uh, finish with some uh, additional aspects of neuroanatomy, and I will mention uh, some of the symptoms uh, associated with spinal cord diseases and transfer myelitis. And I will mention this because the term transfer myelitis is misleading, right? Everybody who 
uh, uh, listen the term transmyelitis for the first time believe that everything is because there is a cross-section uh, uh, of the spinal cord or the lesion is uh, uh, across the spinal cord. Uh, that may happen, but that's not the most uh, frequent situation. In, in, in transmyelitis, we may have partial lesions of the spinal cord that are going to affect either the white matter or the gray matter or both. Okay? And that is what we are going to understand as the heterogeneity of symptoms. Some patients with transverse myelitis start having problems with sensation, right? Other patients start with motor problems. And the reason is, once again, the spinal cord is very well organized. The motor compartment is in the gray matter or in the white matter and is specifically localized in some areas of that spinal cord. The sensory pathways, some of the pathways that are going up are localized also in the specific areas of the spinal cord. So when we do the neurological exam, what we are trying to find out is what part of the spinal cord is affected. For example, this is the posterior region of the spinal cord, okay? When patients have lesions affecting the posterior region of the spinal cord, the outcome is going to be the following. It's going to be lack of steadiness. The patient may be strong, may have full strength in both legs, but they are going to have some difficulties walking around. Why? Because there is, there is not necessarily a good transmission of information from the legs to the brain to tell the brain where the legs are located. So it's a problem that we call proprioception problem. Now, there are other lesions that affect descending pathways, like something that we call corticospinal pathways. And these are pathways that are bringing information from the motor cortex to the spinal cord and subsequently to the muscles in the legs or arms. When that happens, we are going to have problems like paralysis of muscles or stiffness. So we may have a combination of spinal motor problems and spinal sensory problems. So that is the uh, importance of uh, learning what part of the spinal cord is affected, but not necessarily your sp the, the spinal cord is going to be uh, across uh, uh, or lesion across, and obviously it's going to be uh, producing the symptomatology. This is an example of lesions that are localized only in the white matter that is carrying the descending information from the cortex. So those patients are the patients that have paralysis in the legs or in the arms and some degree of uh, stiffness. And there are patients that have only lesions affecting the posterior columns. For example, vitamin B12 deficiency is frequently associated with lesions in these pathways, and that is uh, one of the reasons uh, uh, patients are tested for uh, uh, vitamin deficiencies when there are some problems associated with gait disturbance. Uh, there are degeneration of the spinal cord uh, that affect the gray matter and the white matter. One example is what happened in Lou Gehrig's disease. In Lou Gehrig's disease, the main damage of the spinal cord is in the gray matter, in the gray matter that contains the neurons that carry the motor information, and obviously that's going to produce paralysis, it's going to produce uh, deficits uh, uh, in lower extremities or la uh, upper extremities, and obviously other motor uh, symptoms like increase in spasticity or stiffness. And once again, there is combination of symptoms. For example, when you have a spinal cord uh, damage of the posterior columns or descending pathways, you have a combination of uh, paralysis or, you, uh, or, or the patient may have uh, other type of symptoms like unsteadiness or, or, or difficulties uh, walking around. So let me conclude the uh, presentation with this statement is once again, location, location, location. The topography of the lesion determines the type of symptom. If a patient has a lesion in the cervical spinal cord, that lesion may affect arms and legs. If the lesion is located in the thoracic cord, the arms may be spared, but the legs may be affected, right? If the patient has a lesion in the brain, if this is the right brain, obviously it's going to produce lesions or, or symptoms that are prominently on the left side. If this is in the, right, in the, in the left brain, the problems are going to be manifested mostly in, on, uh, on the other side of the body. So this is an overall view of the anatomy and function of the brain, and I hope that at least some of those concepts 
you may use those in the future lecture so you understand exactly what the other uh, scientists are talking about uh, in terms of demyelination, spinal cord function, or uh, motor dysfunction or sensory dysfunction. Thank you very much.